All right, so Peter Vesey here, Hoop Du Jour, another segment with Dominique Wilkins, who uh, one of my all-time favorite people to be around. Unfortunately, I wasn't around him that much throughout his <laughs> career, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't cover the Hawks. But I remember, uh, let's start right off, I remember traveling with you guys on the West Coast mm -hmm. when Fratello, Mike Fratello was the coach, mm -hmm. and he allowed me to work out with your team. On the, on the coast, I forget where we were and stuff, and I ran full court with you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, unbelievable wow. stuff that you could do in those days. That no, nothing like that would happen today. Man, I remember that, those days. I mean, you know what, though? I, th I think the media and the team had a much closer relationship, you know, between player and media. So it was, it was a little different then. You know, it's like, in a sense, it was a family, sometimes a family you loved and sometimes you hated them, you know, but right. it was still a, a kind of a family environment. So, you know, when I look back the history of, you know, our friendship, you know, and when I first met you, you know, I was like, this guy, Peter Bessie, is no joke. <laughs> he he don't play, man. He said, hey, if you're not playing, he's going to let you know. And so I think that was kind of the start of really understanding what the media was about and how you guys viewed a lot of players. But... Fortunately for me, we were able to build a friendship over those over those years. And you know what happened with a lot of guys? I mean, there, there weren't too many assholes in the league. You know, if they were, they kind of got weeded out yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. But you know, with the way the coaches kind of handled everything too, they let you in the locker room. You know, I mean, on that trip again, mm -hmm. Fratello letting me play. Carr was on your team. Mm -hmm. What's his first name? Antoine. Antoine Carr. So I'm he's I'm guarding him. What is he? Six eight. Six nine. Six nine, about two whatever. Two fifty. And he's elbowing me in the post. <laughs> what the I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, This is why you foul out all the time. I said, what are you hitting me for? Well, we, you know, if you were brave enough to get out there, you know, it was like, okay, you gotta suffer the consequences. If you got sneakers on, you're gonna pay for it. But again, that was just the the comfort level that we had, right, you know, right. with with media, and I tell you, you were the only media person that ever done anything like that with our team, you know, yeah. to, with probably anything. Yeah. And so it, again, it shows you how you know loose and how gracious the teams were, the managements were in those days. Because first of all, you, a lot of the writers you tried to build a relationship with, and as long as you showed respect to those writers, man, a lot of times they took care of you. But if you didn't, you know, right. well, that, you know, that's not the way it should have worked. You know, man, right. But, that, but that's, that's the way it was. Unfortunately, yeah. That's the way it was. Yeah. But again, you know, I've never had really tough relationships with the media because I've always made myself accessible and talked with the media. So it was, it was not a big deal for me. So the only time that Dominique Wilkins and I ever sat down for dinner was in 2018. I'm out in Phoenix. The Hawks come through mm -hmm. to play the Suns. And we went out to eat after the game. And uh, before you even sat down at the table, you weren't even seated yet. Do you remember what you told me? No. You were angry. You said, you know, I'm still pissed off about not being, not being uh, gone. Yeah, yeah uh, took the greatest. With one of the things. That was one of them, right? That was one of them. Another thing I think we talked about, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember. Okay, you know, well, as, we get, as we get older, I'm gonna help we you. forget things. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm going to help you. So you said, yeah, I'm angry I, I didn't make the top 50. And I said, yeah. And I, I think I told you, I know you were 51. I found that out. Mm -hmm. Which probably didn't make you feel any better. No, it didn't. It made no. me even feel worse. 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 <laughs> and the other things, you know, you weren't, you weren't inducted into the Hall of Fame on the first ballot. You know, right. did, I ever t did I tell you a story what happened with that? No. Well, That's what we're here for. I led all votes, coaches and players at that time. And I remember getting a call from the Hall of Fame. They said, we've never made a call like this before. And they decided to do all coaches. No players went in that year. And I'm like, but I led all votes. That's but I was like, okay. No, you weren't happy. And so, no, I wasn't happy about that. But, you know, they did say, hey, there's no way you will be left off next year. And that's the year Barkley, myself, and Joe Dumars went in together. But, man, I said, wow. You know, how, how can it happen? But, you know, the league was really upset about it. You know, you know, stern at the time. Like, how can you leave one of the greatest players in history of, of our sport and you're not going first ballot? 
So and now they're putting in people who don't even deserve. But that's another that's another thing altogether. But you forgot one thing, and I've mm-hmm. thought about it since that mm-hmm. day. You should have been angry about that. You weren't on that dream team. Everybody yeah. talks about Isaiah not being on the dream team. So, okay, but there's a lot of stuff that going into that, a lot of politics and stuff. But you should have made that. You know, yeah, it should have been selected. But I think, too, what really kind of hindered that, too, is that I I think I tore my Achilles tendon during that that time. When? when in 91? 90, 90, yeah, was it 91? Yeah. Oh, you did? Yes. So you hadn't come back yet? No, I hadn't come back yet. All right, well. There's you know, a reason, but, uh, okay. That, you know, the fact that should have been mentioned, that's the thing that, you know, now that when I look back, I'm like, okay. I said, well, you know, I was injured, so. Okay, all right. That. All right, my bad on that. Um, Dominique, I've never, I've never asked you this. I've read different versions of it. When you were drafted by, by Utah mm-hmm. um, and then traded to, to the Hawks, were you going to hold out? Were you going to? Did you want to become a Laker? Did you not want to play for Utah? What What was the deal? Then? Actually, when I came out of before I came out of college, they said if I come out early, especially in my, in my junior year, that I would be the number one pick to the Lakers. But I think at that time, Mitch Kupchak got hurt, so they wanted a forward who could play both forwards, a power forward and a small forward. And James Worthy being a six nine and a half, six ten, was a perfect fit at that time. So I knew if I didn't go first, that I would go third. And so uh, going to Utah, I was not happy about that at mm-hmm. that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know how long after that, and I got traded to Atlanta. And that was like, like I died and went to heaven. Was yeah. there any talk about you joining Worthy in? Oh, yeah. They tried, By the way, you would have been perfect they, that team. They tried to get us both. Right. That's what I so Man, you about. can't even imagine that team. Me and James Worthy or, you know, playing alongside each other with Magic and Kareem. Right. How many championships were that team doing? Right. Right. Did, did it come close? What happened? Well, I heard it was close at times, but teams felt like they had to give up too much to right. get me there with Worthy. So, right. you know, so both ways they had to give up. Some, some so, so the story I heard from Atlanta, from Stan Caston, who was in charge at the time, was when he tried to make the deal, when he did make the deal for you, but leading up to it, he said they had a board meeting, and uh, Ted Turner was at the board meeting, and... Uh, he, he asked what would it take to get, you know, he was told what it would take to get you. I mean, it was a million dollars cash because the Sam Battistone, the owner, was, you know, had no money. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the, the uh, um, Turner's guys, his accountants and stuff, we, we cannot afford this. We can't afford too much money. And Turner said, do it anyway. Yeah, you know, and, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and, it's, and to add to that, also, who was a part of that was Hank Aaron. And Mike Aaron's senior, who was at that time yes. the president of the Hawks, along with Ted Turner, and Ted basically, and actually Hank Aaron said to Ted, "You need to get this guy by any means necessary." Because he's seen me play a lot in college at the University of Georgia. So, with that kind of collaboration with those guys, it's like, yeah, let's do it. Ultimately, it was Ted's decision. He said, right. "Yeah, go ahead and do it." Right, so. And so, and I remember Ted said to me, he said, "Man, I gave up two players." And a million dollars to get you. He thought, I didn't pay that much for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> even when even when he divorced her. <laughs> yeah, that was John's was classic Ted man. John Drew and Freeman Williams. Those, those John Drew and Freeman Williams, Williams and a million dollars. You know, okay. two proven players yes. at that time. Oh yeah, yeah I think John was an all star. Yeah, he, yeah, he was all star. A little Freeman. trouble at the time. Not yeah. a lot, of, a lot of trouble at the time. Yeah, he was with drugs. He was going through some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I saw John Drew too. Many, many, many years later, he lives in Houston. And I hear Driving this guy, a cab. I heard yeah, that. I heard this guy hollering my name. Oh, I'm like, my Who God. That? And I look down the street. I'm looking at this guy, and it's John Drew. And, you know, he came up, gave him a hug, and he looked great. And he said, you know something, Nick? This is the only time in my life I ever had this much peace driving a cab. And sometimes people find different things in life that bring them peace and keep them, you know, leveled out and keep their head straight. And for him... That was it. Was he in the cab when you saw him? Yeah, he was, he was in, in the cab and he got out. Oh my God. I could not believe oh, it. Man. You got photos? <laughs> you know I should have. I didn't get them. But man, I was, I, I was really happy and proud of him and you know how he's changed his life and turned his life around. 
I thought about going to Houston to try to find him, you know, not recently. But mm -hmm. Well, I, I knew he was driving the cab down there, and it would have been a great story. And it yeah. still would be a great story yeah. if, he's, if he's okay. Yeah, he's he's a wonderful guy. He's doing great. He's really mellowed out, you know. Right. Just a good guy. He's just a good guy. I always thought, even when I was in college, I used to come, because he used to live right next door to my mother uh, when I was at University of Georgia. So I, I knew John Drew when I, when I was in college, so... I knew what kind of person he was, you know, he just was going through a lot of personal stuff, you know, to drugs and all these different things. Right. But, you know, the fact that, you know, he can, can find his way in something that no one would have ever imagined yeah, to find his peace. Tremendous. It's tremendous. Yeah, it's yeah. a tremendous story. Yeah. I remember I had a line on him. Uh, he's probably still angry about it. But, you know, he didn't play much defense. I said, yeah, but he gets back fast on offense. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. But I'm going to tell you something. One of the hardest guys I ever had to guard. Why? Was John Drew. Why? He was so crafty, so skilled, and so strong. He found ways to make you foul. So you always had to keep your hands up. You know, you couldn't reach with him. Mm. Or if he, he was going to send him to the free throw line. He was, man, a crafty, crazy guy. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hell out of watching him play. Um, you, I remember another instance when you were, you lost the, the dunk contest to, to Michael at mm -hmm. an all-star game. Mm -hmm. And we happened to run into each other mm -hmm. at the airport that day. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. You remember? Going back 30-something. Yeah, whatever yeah. year it was. Yeah. Whatever yeah. Year, you hadn't won one yet. Mm -hmm. and, and you got robbed. There's no question. Actually, was it in Chicago? I won one before that. You had won one in, before? In Indianapolis. I think it was my second year in the league. Yeah. All right, well, I, I don't remember that part of it. So we're, not gonna, so we're gonna ignore that part of it. But we're going to ignore Maybe. the truth. But, but I remember saying to you at the airport, you were very upset. And I, and I told you at the time, I said, you know, you, it's going to come back. You're going you're gonna to get that. I think you got the next one. Yes. You know what? At that time, because we were competitors. Right. Jordan and I were competitors. And so, yeah, we were, I wanted to win. But, you know, I love competing against Mike. Um, but, you know, as years went on, I realized how special that um, contest was. And it wasn't about winning and losing. It's, it's what we did as, as you know, competitors that they could talk about this dunk contest to this very day. You're talking about 30, 3, 34 years later. Right. And they're still talking about it. So I didn't realize the history he and I was making. And you know, now not being competitors, we appreciate how we lifted each other to that next level. Have you talked about that at all? You know, we never talked about it. We, it's kind of an unspoken thing between he and I. But one thing he had said recently, he said, man, you know, Nick, you won. Ah! And I said, well, how you doing, Mike? <laughs> but, uh, so give me the trophy. Yeah, yeah. but, you know, we, we, we did a little skit where we kind of referred to that. But he and I, we just love playing against one another. It's never been any animosity. It's never been any type of hate between us. Right. It was just, we were just fierce competitors. And that's what it was about with us. All right, so, you, you know, you talk, you talk glowingly about you know, competing against Michael, but the the guy which really grabbed me when we met when we had dinner that night was the, the way you talk about Larry Bird. You you have yeah. such such profound respect for him. Uh, so I, I just yeah. it, it just would take your time and explain how that all. I know you've done it before with people. I've seen it, but that night at the table, you mm -hmm. really grabbed me with stuff Larry you said. Larry was a unique talent, a unique person when it comes to competing in this sport. I never met anyone quite like him. Because Larry wasn't a super athletic guy. And I ask kids all the time, if you had to choose between a great basketball player or a great athlete, which would you choose? And most young kids would say a great athlete. But mm -hmm. that's your first mistake. Because a great athlete is going to give you a lot of oohs and ahs. A great basketball player is going to beat you every night. That's who Larry Bird was. A great basketball player that he wanted to take your heart. A lot like Michael and Magic and people like they right. wanted to take your did you, heart. Did you want to take And I was the same. Yeah, okay. I was the same. Okay. You know, I was that category. same mentality. You yeah. know, I'm coming at you hundred miles an hour. Right. That's just the way I played. So I didn't really care who you were. But the Bird and Wilkins matchups, man, was legendary. because um, I remember in that game seven. And we should have won a game six. What year was we, that? I wanna say 87 or something like that, I think yeah. it was. So this was the, the, it was the semifinals of semifinals, the... Semifinals, the seventh game. Yeah. 
but we should have won in six. We blew our opportunity. And Bird, I remember making a prediction. He said, Atlanta blew the opportunity of guaranteeing a win in Boston. And this is headlines we had to see in the paper. So I put that article in our locker room in Boston. And I remember coming out of the locker room and said, we're going to win this bleak, bleak game. If you ain't ready to fight, you ain't ready to go to war, don't come out. So whoever guarded me tonight going to have a long night. Well, unfortunately, Larry Bird was saying the same thing to his team. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it's set up for the greatest shootout Absolutely. Um, in seventh game history. You know, and um, I remember, Bird, I mean, I was going pretty good most of the night. I was pretty hot. And Bird had four, 12 points going into the fourth quarter. That's all. And I remember we running down the court, and Kevin Willis reached across me and put his finger, like, close to Bird's chest. He said, don't let this so-and-so score anymore tonight. And I looked at Kevin, oh, I'm Kevin, like, shut up. Yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> and his eyes got so big. And he had 22 or something like 24 in their fourth quarter. It was unreal. He ended up, but put it this way, he ended up with 34. And you had 40. And I had 46. 46. And so he had that great shootout in that fourth quarter. It was, it came down to who was going to make the last shot. And so he had two great players trying to match each other's will, trying to will our team to a win. And I was so hot in that game when I, I got the missed shot on the rebound. I come to half court. I'm ready to let it fly to try to win the game. And Danny Ains tackles me before I had a chance to shoot the half because he was, they were, Foul to get hit that shot. They had a foul to get. And so, no, it wasn't a foul to get. No. They sent me to the free throw line. They just line. sent you the free throw Yeah. Because I think, no, I think we were we were down three. We were down three. So you three. want a three-pointer. So they didn't want that three-pointer. And so, eh, man. So, yeah, Larry Bird was uh, and, competitive and, off the and charts. And you told, me, you told me that he never spoke to you until. We never shook hands. Yep, no, we until never shook when? hands. We never spoke our whole career. Ever. Ever. And so we retired. Until you retired. Well, we like to talk about it because we love the story. So Larry and I <laughs> have a really cool friendship, relationship that, you know, we see each other, man, we always give each other respect and have, a, you know, short conversations. Because, you know, Larry don't talk a lot. And, but the respect that he showed me. And I remember after that seventh game, he said to me, he said, man, you gave us everything we, we wanted. He said, we both deserve to win this game. He said, unfortunately. So he did say us, something. Yeah. And he said, right. unfortunately, one of us got to go on. I think that's the biggest respect I ever gotten from an iconic player, especially in a loss like that. Right. Because of the way we battled right. in that series. Right. You know. I remember writing about teams. It's a shame somebody had to win. Mm -hmm. But this is a little different. It was a man. I remember it, was, it felt like 110 degrees in that Boston Garden. The electricity in that building was off the charts. So that set up. I knew at the beginning my palms were sweating before the game. I knew I was going to have a big night. I just knew it. How that big didn't be nervous, night. right? Oh, I was so nervous. Yeah. And, you know, and I promise you he felt that way too, that right. he was going to have a big night. Right. And he did. So you also told me about a, a teammate, a Hawks, a Hawks player, who had some negative stuff to say about Smith on your team, yeah, about Bird. And you told him. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I remember Josh was really the Josh Smith. He was a young guy. Right. And he said, we showed him a tape of me and showed him a tape of Larry Bird. And he said to one of the coaches, man, Larry Bird would never score against me. I said, young fella, come here. <laughs> Don't ever say that outside this room. <laughs> I said, let me tell you how big he was, how great he was. I said, uh, I was one of the greatest athletes ever played in this game. He had 60 against me. I said, guys foul out trying to guard him. I said, you know, I've had big games against him, 40s and 50s and stuff like that. But when you play against a guy can give you the same 40, 50, and 60 on any given night, you can't stop him by yourself. I said, I ever say that outside of this room. And so he got it. But he was, he was a young kid then. Right. Well, speaking about young kids, another thing that really I really loved that night when we spoke was you talking about your kids. Yeah. Can, can you can you tell me, tell the audience about well, your you know, children? I, well, I'm how sorry, you fit in? I have five grand, no, six grandkids, one great granddaughter. So I got some grands. Um, but, you know, I'm proud of all my kids. You know, the kids are a blessing in life, a blessing in my life. You told me your boy was a, getting to be a really good player. Yeah, well, point. my oldest son played uh, University of Virginia his last year. He was defensive player of the year in the ACC. Now he's an assistant coach over at Virginia now. So he's What's his name? Isaiah Wilkins. Okay. And then my youngest son, he's 15, 6'9". Yeah. And he can play. 
Oh, uh, we're going to be hearing about it. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Oh, What's yeah. his name? Jacob Dominique Wilkins. He's a, uh, he can play. Was he, was he Dominique, the middle name Dominique, before well, you we, knew how, well, it, how good I he was? To, or? I, you know, I couldn't give him my whole name because my sister took my whole name and gave it to my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not a junior. He's a junior, but oh, that's you know, I don't call him junior. That's funny. Yeah. And what about your daughter? We have a special needs daughter, right. Spinal Bifida, who's, of course, uh, loved my life. And she's been through a lot. She's been through 18 surgeries. And she is a, she's a warrior, man. And uh, to be through the things that she's been through. And, and what's her father? Name? What's her name? Jolie Taylor. Jolie Taylor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell, tell us about Jolie. Yeah. And th again, you know, she had spinal bifida at birth. Yeah. And so she had, had serial casting. I mean, she's had multiple, multiple surgeries, bone graft, all types of things. But and to this day, she's a very independent woman, little girl. And how old so is she? 14. 14. So she's... Uh, you know, she's one of those kids that, that perse perseveres through adversity. So she has your competitive spirit. Very. You know, because, you know, she asked me, why can't she play basketball? Why can't she play? I said, you can't. So she did wheelchair basketball for a while nationally. And they were really? ranked number three or four in the country. You know, and then she said, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. She started modeling. I don't want to do this anymore. She started painting. You know, so she oh, does nice, so many different nice. things. And I'm, and I'm happy to see that. And you see her often? Yeah, I've raised my two young kids myself, so, yeah. So is she still living with you? Oh, yeah, no question. Oh, okay. She's not going anywhere. Okay, all right, all right. And neither is the father. No, and uh, <laughs> hey, as long as I'm walking, I'm going to always be there in her life to help her. Yeah, so it's it's it's, it's, it's a fun time yeah. now because, you know, she's she's doing well. I remember you telling me about her. Right? Yeah. I really wanted to hear about yeah. her, her upgrading, you know, what, what's, yeah. what's going on. So she's doing good. She's doing good. That's great, man. So, um... Congratulations on the top 75. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what was your initial response when, when you were told? I think I let you know on, I was, on Twitter. You yeah, were gonna, you did. You I, did. I was gonna, yeah. There's no I was way elated. you were getting in this. I was time. elated. You know, and, I mean, even though you know you wanted the best, but to be recognized as one of the best, that's sure. what blows you away. And it's kind of surreal feeling that you go through. Even now, it's like, until I get on, you know, out there on the court with all those guys, man, how special is that going to be? Right. I mean, you... I mean, you know, you know, there's one of the greatest players to ever played this game, top 75 players ever. Right. I mean, there's only few in life ever get a chance to experience something like that. Right. So, yeah, and, and, and when you're in that position, it doesn't matter who's one or who's 75. You're all great. Right. So it doesn't matter. Right. What, what, what's great is it's not done posthumously. Right. <laughs> there's so many awards that are given to people after they die. Like, mm -hmm. really? You know, would have been much better when they were here. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we've, we've got a lot of people who's not here anymore. Yes. That's a part of that list. And uh, we got to continue to remember those guys. And the most recent one is, you know, Kobe Bryant, you know, who, you know, I still think about a lot. You know, man, what a person, you know, what a talent, what a human being he was. You know. Did you have a relationship with yeah, Kobe? Yeah, you know, yeah, I really, I did. And, um, you know, Kobe and our relationship was, you know, more personal where we show appreciation to one another and we talk from time to time whenever we saw each other and he's always showed me respect and I've always showed him respect and and it was uh it was a heartbreaking experience when you know we heard the passing of him so right he's gonna be missed he's still missed right I was uh I used to double date a little bit with his father and mother mm -hmm. uh, when, they, when, they, when, when Joe played for mm -hmm. Philly mm -hmm. So I was always telling Kobe, I said, Kobe, I knew you before you were even born. Yeah. I said, I knew you, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, those are, the, those are the good times and that you, you can cherish and remember. And those days, uh, you'll never forget. And so to be a part of this list, man, it's, it's everything. Will you, will you do anything special here? Will you try to take pictures with everybody? Will you try to as, get autographs of people? What as will you many do? guys as I can. But you know, I think we can do autographs. That's when we have posters and stuff with all the guys. On that uh, stuff we autograph, but you know those pictures are memorable. Yeah, and they're valuable. You know, um, so yeah, we'll be taking quite a few pictures with a lot of guys. You know, it's a lot of guys that I'm close to, like Clyde Drexler and Michael, and you know Dr. J, and right. you know, and one of my closest friends that, I'm, that I definitely miss too is uh, Moses Malone. Right. You know, guys like that. You know, man. yeah. You, you miss those guys. Yeah, no question. Mm -hmm. And, and so many of them died young, like Moses. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. 
Well, Dominique, I, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for for doing this. I uh, I really enjoy being in your company. And, well, thank you, man. And, and congratulations Always again. Always a pleasure, man. Yeah. Always, man. Yeah.